This is the T.J. Patterson Library. It's named for Patterson and his wife. Uh, Patterson was a city councilman, long-term city councilman, the first one uh, in Lubbock, and uh, very important uh, in being a voice for a community that hadn't had a voice on the city council before. My mother was active in the Methodist Church, women's organizations, and they were supportive of, this is in the, before desegregation, they were supportive of black colleges. The Methodist Church, church that we went to, uh, or which our church was a part of the denomination, had women's groups who were very much in favor of improving education, black, white, whoever. And she actually ended up, she was one of the leaders in this women's group for kind of the Southwest. And she ended up being put on the board of Houston College, which was the Methodist Black College in Austin. And I was a little kid, but I remember her taking me out there with her. And, uh, you know, so unlike my friends who never saw anybody except a yard man, African American, in the neighborhood where we lived in most of West Austin, for that matter, here were all these well-dressed, you know, African Americans in suits and, and nice dresses, you know, going to school and professors. And so, you know, I knew something that my friends didn't know, and I, I, I would tell them about it once in a while, and they'd kind of shake their heads, oh, really, <laughs> you know. But people have to learn, you know, about realities, you know, and that was, I guess, one thing that made me more interested maybe as I matured, you know, to try to write a book like this. It's called Black Texans, The History of African Americans in Texas. Texas is going to be a Spanish colony at first, or part of, in a sense, an extension of Mexico, which is a Spanish colony. The uh, number of African Americans in Texas is limited there, there was slavery in Mexico, but there were also people who'd gained their freedom. And so there are both some slaves, but also some free blacks. In, during the Spanish period in Texas, the colonies are not very large, and there may be a couple of thousand settlers, and among them, people who are primarily free, free blacks, some of them of mixed ancestry. Uh, number maybe uh, 20 percent of that couple of thousand so you know it's a relatively small group but it is again the beginning point of any kind of african-american presence in texas and that continues up until um, the early 1800s when mexico then revolts for its independence from spain Mexico, along with most of the Latin American countries that revolted against Spain, in, during that period of revolution, began to take the first steps toward emancipating their slaves, uh, bringing an end to slavery in, in what were now becoming independent countries. Well, the new Anglo slaveholders are moving in. Don't want that to happen, of course, because it would affect them. And so this becomes one, maybe not the only, but an important part of the tension that's developing between the Mexican government and these Anglo settlers. All of this becomes the Texas Revolution. And it's interesting to note that there are at least a few African Americans with the Texas Army in almost every battle. Uh, a man named Hendrick Arnold is one of the guides when the Texans attack and capture San Antonio, which is the only battle they won until San Jacinto. <laughs> so African Americans did play some role in the Texas Revolution. And the interesting thing is that even though these men had, although their numbers were limited, had served in the Revolution on the Texas side, the Anglo-Texans who want to control slavery are not 
too happy with the idea of free blacks because free blacks represent a, a role model that, that they don't want slaves to see. And so they pass a lot of laws once the Republic of Texas is set up. They pass a lot of laws that limit free blacks. Free blacks can't vote in elections. Uh, they can't serve on juries. They're discouraged. You know, additional free blacks are discouraged from even coming in. At one point, there's even an attempt to force the ones who are there out. It doesn't take place. Ironically, Sam Houston puts off what was a piece of legislation by the Texas Congress, and so it doesn't happen. But there are some real limitations on free blacks. Then, of course, Texas joins the United States uh, in the 1840s, uh, and that opens the way, of course, for people to bring in even more slaves because it's now not from one country to another, but from one state to another. So slavery is growing. Uh, at the time of the Texas Revolution, there were about 5,000 slaves in Texas, and I know this is carrying over from <laughs> one chapter to the other in the book, but there are only about 5,000 slaves at that time. By the time of the Civil War, this is 1836 to 1860, not a long period of time. The number of slaves in Texas has grown to 180,000. Texas is part of the Confederacy and raises soldiers for the Confederate Army, significant numbers of soldiers, some of whom guard the coast or the frontier, but many of them are off on battlefields. Uh, one brigade of white Texas soldiers fights with Robert E. Lee all the way in Virginia, and even larger groups serve in the Confederate armies up and down the Mississippi that are trying to stop the Union advance there. So Anglo-Texans are overwhelmingly Confederate, while uh, slaves are all privately hoping the Union wins. And certainly some of them try to escape uh, even before the Civil War. Slaves from Texas were trying, and in some cases, successfully escaping into Mexico across the Rio Grande because that was freedom you know, from slavery for them. And so that's going to continue during the Civil War and others if the Union armies get close enough, you know, which doesn't happen too often in Texas. The war is fought primarily in other areas. We'll try to, but if they, if they come close enough, the slaves would try to escape to the Union armies which is mainly in Mexico, in Arkansas, or in what's now Oklahoma, what then was an Indian territory. And the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect all through the Confederate States. And so you have new opportunities for African Americans. Obviously lingering opposition, you know, the Ku Klux Klan is gonna appear, you know, within a short period of time and, and other kinds of, of violent opposition to freedom is still going to linger in a sporadic way across the state. But, and at first, even though freedom has been granted, there's not a clear-cut set of rights coming with it. The Emancipation Proclamation says people are free, but it doesn't say what else they can do. What they do is pass segregation laws. Schools can exist, but they have to be separate black and white schools. And what that means is that an increasingly reluctant state government is probably going to provide, in fact does provide, less money for the uh, black schools as opposed to the white schools. And local county or city governments are going to take the same approach. You know, they're going to do kind of the bare minimum to keep from getting in trouble, but the overall trend is for a real difference between the way whites and blacks are being treated in schools and 
in terms of society. Uh, you know, segregation can segregate places to eat, places, hotels, uh, as well as schools and even participation, you know, in some activities, you know, so. The most significant changes actually come with the Great Depression because up to that time, African Americans were either tenant farmers where they didn't own the land, they had to rent the land, and their some farms were very small, or they simply worked outright for some white farmer as farm hands. You know, as this part of Texas uh, begins to be settled, and it's settled mainly after the Civil War. There are black cowboys, there are about black cooks who work on the ranches, uh, and some of those cowboys will become fairly well known. Uh, there's a man named A.D. John Wallace who starts out as a cowboy but saves his money and eventually is able to buy some cattle and buy some land and becomes a, at least a a small-scale rancher in his own right. That's not common, but it does happen in a few cases. And there are others who establish themselves as important figures. Uh, there's a man named Matthew Bones Hooks. And Hooks is a, a bronc buster who, in effect, breaks, breaks from being wild, wild horses, so that they can be used in ranching and at four cowboys. The real problem in terms of change comes with the Great Depression of the 1930s because it literally drives thousands of tenant farmers off the land. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of unemployment and black unemployment is somewhat higher than white unemployment. Another one of those patterns where discrimination plays a role. But it's a period of change, and as the nation, as the New Deal programs calm the, the economy and it start to bring it back, then the Second World War comes along and a lot of unemployed men are drafted into the army, which begins to give them jobs. And uh, so the Depression comes to an end. Uh, one statistic that sticks in my mind is that 20, 20 to 25 percent of the soldiers from Texas in the First World War were African American. And same thing's true in the Second World War. The percentage may not be quite as high, but there's significant numbers. And there are people who rise, to, you know, to officer status, although the numbers, percentage, are obviously not as, not as great as among Anglos, but there are still problems, and it's in the period after the Second World War that you begin to get growing concern being expressed about the continuation of these of the discrimination. So that by the you know the wars in the 1940s, uh, there are organizations that have been established like the. NAACP, uh, which has chapters in Texas by the mid-20th century. Um, so there are groups that are trying to fight through the courts to break down some of these barriers, and that's becoming more common. And ultimately then, by the 50s and 60s, you have some serious challenges. For example, in Texas, one of the problems politically was a white primary. Now, that's, you know, the primary is the first election where parties choose their candidates and then they run in the fall in the general election. The problem was that the Democratic Party had come to dominate. The Republicans had been strong during Reconstruction, but they fade because they had supported, you know, breaking down some barriers. And so the Democrats dominate Texas politics from the period after Reconstruction well into the 20th century. And they tend to want to maintain you know, the, the discrimination. Well, 
the white primary is used by the Democratic Party to keep African Americans from voting, and yet whoever wins the Democratic primary during that long span of time is almost guaranteed to win the general election in the fall. So being able to vote in the Democratic primary is important. Well, eventually, an African American dentist named Lonnie Smith goes to court to challenge again the last version of the white primary and the federal courts rule in his favor. And so the white primary is finally put to bed, so to speak, is thrown out. You, know, you not only have the end of the white primary, but then of course you've got uh, the Brown decision on public schools and that had to be followed up. You know, you, you think the United States Supreme Court has ruled against school desegregation. You'd be surprised what kind of games local school boards can play, you know, where they claim that they're integrating, but they draw odd lines and do odd things, you know, to keep people apart. And so, you know, local spokesmen, leaders for the African American community had to go to court over and over again to break down these lingering barriers uh, when it came to school desegregation. And uh, the Brown decision was in the 50s. The uh, the other major case that was important in Texas, but even had a larger impact, was the Sweat case. Heman Sweat goes to court, claims that he wants to enter, and, and he had tried. He'd, he'd gone through the process of trying to apply to the University of Texas Law School, which is considered the leading law school in the state, connected to the University of Texas in Austin. And they turn him down because he's black. There's no question about why. Because he has the educational background, you know. Uh, you know, the reality was that he had support from the NAACP, which had calculated all the factors that might be used against him. They, they were looking for someone who would qualify to apply. And they found Sweat. Sweat had the background. So he wins the case, but not before the University of Texas tries to create a black law school. And, and it was ironic because their first black law school was two white professors from the UT law faculty in an office downtown in Austin. <laughs> and that was the whole black law school. Well, it was clear that wasn't going to meet a, a decent challenge in court. So then they they took what had been an African-American community college in Houston and turned it into what is now Texas Southern University, which initially is a, a black university, a state-supported university, and created a law department down there. Well, this, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know, you have a much smaller faculty. You don't have a law library that is anywhere near the University of Texas Law Library, which was 100 years old by that time, or close to it. And uh, so they said, even though you're trying on the surface, you're not coming close to creating an equivalent education. And so they ruled in Sweat's favor, and that becomes a major case in terms of beginning the process of breaking down college segregation in Texas and in much of the Southwest, the states surrounding it, in the present, and I won't pick on anyone by name, don't have a very clear grasp of American history. And I think that really hurts their ability to understand where we are and, and, and what our ideals how our ideals have gotten us to this point and why we don't want to back up on that because of what it would create in terms of inequality.
what African Americans went through, you know, in these various stages where where they were controlled and discriminated against and what a struggle it's been over a long period of time to to have a Patterson Library, which is a great step forward. 